Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with Progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see people are still continuing to join our webcast, so let's give them just another few seconds, and then we'll get started. Thank you to all of, all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people living with MS every day. So as I chat with our expert today, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube Live, or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. When it comes to managing multiple sclerosis, we continue to see real progress, including a better understanding of the disease, new oral and longer acting therapies, and better insight into lessening MS damage. Still, coping with MS is challenging, and disease-modifying therapies can play an important role in managing MS early and later in your MS journey. Today's expert is Dr. Scott Newsom. Dr. Newsom is an Associate Professor of Neurology and Director of Neurosciences Consultation and Infusion Center at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Newsom also serves as a co-director of the Multiple Sclerosis Experimental Therapeutics Program at Johns Hopkins, and his main research focuses on helping identify and test novel therapies and therapeutic strategies in multiple sclerosis. Welcome and thank you for being with us today, Dr. Newsom. I think most people understand that disease-modifying therapies are a cornerstone of any MS treatment plan. But how do they actually work? And do they all work the same? Or do some disease-modifying therapies work differently than others? Thank you, John and National MS Society for uh, bringing me on board. I love doing these type of uh, webinars. Um, especially in this uh, unprecedented time, so we can connect with people in a different way. Um, so as you, you mentioned, uh, the disease-modifying therapies have been the cornerstone of treating uh, the immune system as it relates to uh, multiple sclerosis. And, um, you know, we're very lucky, actually, nowadays in having this sort of broad spectrum of therapies that target the immune system in different ways. And I say, why we're lucky is because uh, when we start someone on a therapy and say it's not working for that individual, maybe they're not um, either tolerating the medication or we're seeing uh, disease activity as it relates to their MS, we can switch to another medication that maybe has a different way of acting towards the immune system. And so the goal of these disease modifying therapies, as I think the audience is probably quite familiar with, is really to prevent new things related to MS. You know, whether it's preventing relapses uh, that people experiencing, prevents new spots on MRI, and the hope is that by preventing new activity, that down the road that will also help prevent disability, disability worsening. And so having sort of this armamentarium uh, that we can choose from is very helpful. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to say that Thinking back just a little over 20 years ago, uh, we had really nothing, right? And so here, fast forward, uh, 2020, we have almost 20 medications that have been FDA approved that have proven in clinical trials to help people with multiple sclerosis. And uh, I think as the audience is probably familiar with now, we have a few therapies that have been approved for progressive MS, which has for many years been a huge unmet need uh, and it still is an unmet need from a therapeutic perspective, but 
we're we're really here and helping a lot of people, which is great. You know, this is a question that actually comes up regularly. If someone has no evident impairment or disability and mild disease activity, do they need to be on the disease modifying therapy? Yeah, I, in fact, I was uh, in clinic this week and heard the same exact question uh, from an individual who was newly diagnosed and recovered very well from her relapse. MRI, which we call burden of disease, the number of spots on the MRI was not so bad. Um, and so you could ask yourself, well, maybe I, I have a quote unquote benign form of NMS or a mild case. Uh, so maybe I just don't need to do that. Maybe I can just do lifestyle modifications or uh, go sort of a uh, naturopathic, so to speak, uh, path. I would say if, when we look at MS in general, um, all the information that we have from studies in our anecdotal experience in the clinic, this is a difficult disease. You know, short of a cure, the majority of people will have issues down the road related to their MS if untreated. And so we encourage people, regardless of how mild the disease may look at front, to get on therapy to prevent, you know, downstream effects to disability worsening, which can come from the, uh, you know, activity, the inflammation that we see behind the scenes. And uh, we do know that there are newer biomarkers or newer tests that are going to become available that are actually giving us an insight of what is happening behind the scenes in individuals who may on paper or on MRI look like they're mild cases, but there's stuff that's happening sort of below the surface that we're just learning more about. And we don't wanna look back and say, shoot, we should have done something five years ago. Because without, right now, you know, not having a cure or having therapies that can really repair the damage as of yet, uh, we don't want our patients and our loved ones to to you know develop any disability that we can't yet reverse. So I was about to ask you what the profile was. You know who should consider getting on a disease modifying therapy, but I think I just heard the answer. The profile is someone who's been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Am I getting that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know I would say, and I'm sure we'll talk about this uh, later in the program. Um, there are some people that may be at uh, a certain stage in their life where potentially we have to come back to the table and say, okay, is this medication really benefiting you more than the potential risks that come with the medication that someone's on? And so I do feel that there's probably a subgroup of people, uh, and you may think about people that are a little bit older in life, maybe they haven't had any what we call disease activity in a long time, i.e. relapses, new spots on MRI. Maybe their bedside exam is not really changing greatly. Um, and you have to ask yourself, well, are we starting to get into the decade of life where you're gonna start potentially having other additional risk that we have to contend with? Um, and so I do think that there's a, a subgroup of people, but uh, I would say by and large, uh, the majority of people that at least I see who we put forward a diagnosis of MS, we're having that conversation about starting a therapy. Well, you're right. I do want to circle back to that topic in a couple of minutes. Before we do, when we talk about disease-modifying therapies, can you explain what high efficacy means? Yeah, so this is another conversation that comes up often uh, in clinic, you know, and the one the one question that I hear often is like, well, give me the the uh, the Porsche of therapies. I don't want the Toyota Camry. You know, I want the the biggest gun that you have. And you know, so high efficacy, uh, at least my interpretation of what defines high efficacy, is when we look at the pivotal clinical trials um, in how well a medication performs against either placebo or maybe active comparator, like another FDA-approved therapy. We look at well. What is its impact on preventing relapses? What is its impact on preventing new spots on the MRI? And then also uh, disability worsening within the short clinical trials. And so what you can see clearly 
uh, that there is a distinction when we look at these inflammatory markers uh, where we would put certain medications in a high efficacy bin and other ones sort of in that modest efficacy bin or low efficacy, uh, however you want to uh, uh, you know, put the terminology to place. And so I would say though, we have to be cautious uh, with the medications and just saying, oh, we need to go full steam ahead with the high efficacy drugs versus maybe a more modestly effective drug. Uh, because the averages that we see in clinical trials, those are averages. That means that some people did extremely well. They were like 100% responders and then others that did not. And so I think when we look at the individual level, really you could pick any number of therapies that will work for that individual. And you just have to monitor people over time to see if that first or second choice is the right fit for the individual. Um, and I would have to say, at least in my practice, it does come down to shared decision-making. You know, we look at what are we seeing from an MS disease activity perspective? What's the MRI tell us? How did someone recover from a relapse? Um, so that's important when we put into the equation what choices of therapies we may move towards. And then what about the, the patient themselves? What are they interested in going forward with? And I say that, and for the people that know me and have heard me talk before, I always say that the best medication for the individual is the one they'll take. And, you know, that's, that is, I know it's a very simple statement, but I can tell you early on in my career, I had uh, the opportunity to prescribe certain medications that I thought was the perfect medication for the individual. And they decided not to take it because they didn't feel it was a good fit for them. And they came back and said, well, you know, doctor, I, I decided not to start this medication because I just didn't feel like it was a good fit for me. It's like, oh boy. So that was a good lesson for me to say, okay, well, we need to meet halfway with our patients and really figure out what is the best therapy for that individual, not just up front, but over time. Well, I think as you just so well stated, one of the most daunting decisions that pops up, and unfortunately it pops up very early in someone's MS journey is making a decision about their disease modifying therapy. We've heard from Carrie who said when she was diagnosed, her doctor sent her home with three or four drug company pamphlets to read with instructions to call the office back and let them know which therapy she preferred. Meanwhile, Denise wrote that her doctor gave her no choice at all and recommended a single specific therapy when she was diagnosed. Now, these two approaches represent the opposite ends of a spectrum. Neither sounds particularly ideal. If someone finds themselves in one of these scenarios, well, what factors should they consider in the selection of an MS therapy? How, how much homework should the patient be doing? And as, as you've just pointed out, are taking an individual's goals, values, preferences, and risk tolerance important in that consideration? Yeah, so all those things that you just mentioned at the very end of that statement are, in my view, critical to take into consideration. Um, I think we do have to work with our patients to think about what are the short-term goals for that individual and what are the long-term goals. Um, and I mention that because, yes, we're very lucky we have all these therapies, but it is becoming more complicated to figure out what is the exact medication for that individual that's sitting in front of you. Um, and that's because really we, we don't have long-term studies that are shedding light into uh, what is the long-term prognosis of a person if you start on X treatment strategy or X medication? So we might find out that, um, you know, high efficacy drugs, low efficacy drugs, starting on at the beginning of someone's journey may put someone at the same disability or, I don't like to use disability, but ability level or functionality down the road. And so we don't have that information right now. Um, I would say to circumvent back what you uh, asked, these two opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of um, laying the groundwork for people to make a decision. Um, you know, I think, at least for me, we usually will meet with people and we'll confirm our 
not confirm that they have MS. And if we confirm, yes, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, I usually will bring someone back after we talk through that this is what the person has and what is the data that we have to make that diagnosis. And then when we bring them back in a short follow-up, um, then we can have that discussion about um, what do we do moving forward, you know, from a disease modifying therapy perspective and also equally important symptomatic intervention. And so uh, as a specialist, I think it's my job to try to educate people as best as possible. And then also hear from the individual, what are, again, their goals, both short-term and long-term, and also try to get an idea of um, what is most valuable for them where they will adhere to the medication. Meaning, you know, uh, the same person that I was mentioning uh, earlier that I saw this week, they told me right from the get-go, I will not do an injection. A self medicine injection, I've read a little bit about them, there's no way I can do that. So guess what? Our discussion was tailored to non-self-administered injectable therapies. Um, I think what, sort of that's long-winded, but I think we have to really feel the person out that's living with this condition and get a better idea of how they want to be directed or how they're going to direct the conversation, honestly. There are some people that will say to me, just you make the decision. I still don't go down that path and say, oh, this is the one that you absolutely have to be on. We still have that shared decision making. Um, I can tell you, I never give pamphlets. Um, and even early on, I never gave them because I felt like that was uh, uh, misleading people. Uh, and that's a whole separate webinar, I'm sure we could do. Um, so we don't, we don't actually use pamphlets. I think, you know, we will ask people to try to educate themselves. So, you know, um, even if it's someone who doesn't necessarily want to read an encyclopedia related to these medicines, but we do ask them to educate themselves, at least having some bit of knowledge uh, about the different medications. So when they come back to see us, I feel like we have a, a more fruitful conversation about uh, where we can have that shared decision making. You know, we've heard from Daryl, who's in the process of making a therapy decision. And Daryl read that African Americans with MS may not respond well to interferons. And he wants to know if there's any evidence about this. So if, if I can broaden Daryl's question just a little bit, Dr. Newsom, what do we know about whether race plays a role in the effectiveness of certain therapies for MS? Yeah, no, this, this is an important um topic uh, and it goes back to are there these prognostic integrators up front that may change the way you treat people whether it's up front or when you're switching to a different medication and there's a whole laundry list of uh, what I call uh, clinical and paraclinical factors and under the sort of clinical factors are demographics race etc and so Yes, there are a number of studies, and many of which have been published over the last, I would say, several years, um, that have shown African Americans, Hispanics, um, have what it seems like upfront uh, a more aggressive onset of MS, and so that could enter into the equation with respect to, you know, how we're going to treat people. Um, now. Regarding interferons, there have been some retrospective studies showing that folks of color, specifically African Americans, don't seem to have as much of a robust impact in quieting their disease down as, let's say, their Caucasian counterparts. Um, it's not clear why that is. Um, however, if I see someone who is African American, regardless of what their disease activity is up front, even if it's a mild case, so to speak, I will not go towards interferon therapies as a choice for them. And it's based on not just one study, several studies actually. Um, not to say that I haven't had people on interferon who are of color. And in fact, I have some people that are still on interferon therapies from way back when, because that's all we had. And they've happened to do actually quite well. Right. So, I, you know, I think we have to look at the individual situation, the individual um, case, so to speak, and just be dynamic in how we treat people over time. If something's not working, 
then we need to step back and take a, a, a different look. Well, speaking about treating people on an individual basis, what about people who have other health conditions in addition to MS, like type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease? Should these comorbidities be considered in determining an MS therapy? Without a doubt, without a doubt. We know from the pivotal clinical trials uh, with the current FDA approved therapies, um, some of the side effect profiles uh, don't lend themselves good treatment options if someone has some of the comorbidities that you mentioned, or even as someone gets older, like we all are as we're on this webinar, um, comorbidities can pop up or even aging as a quote unquote comorbidity. Um, we do have to look at the therapies we have, look at the safety profiles that we know about from trials or from after they get FDA approved, what are we seeing over time? And then personalize that treatment approach based on what we know and maybe some of the uncertainty of a medication. So we absolutely take that into consideration. I do wanna make one, one last point about this is that we know now, and it, we've sort of known for a while, but I think this is important to press upon people. We know that if someone has, let's say diabetes or cardiovascular disease, that's poorly controlled, that can actually be associated with worse MS outcomes. And so we do a lot of education within the clinic to talk about healthy lifestyle choices, and then also making sure that your other medical comorbidities are un, under optimal control. And that's really gonna help uh, your MS and vice versa, right? And so I think that that's something to take in consideration even beyond the disease modifying therapies. Jackie reached out to us, said she was diagnosed six months ago. She's 30 years old, and Jackie wants to start a family ASAP. And she wants to know if there are MS therapies that would not be appropriate for her to take. What do you advise women who are considering starting a family regarding MS therapy options? Yeah, obviously we get this a lot because if you think about who are the people we're treating mostly? It's young women in these sort of um, childbearing ages. And so this is this is tricky, right? Because, um, you know, I'm certainly not in a position where I'm going to, you know, say, oh, this is what you absolutely have to do. Don't have any children. Um, so fortunately, we have data from studies that can help guide some of our discussions with people uh, who are interested in starting a family. And so, um, there are several studies now that have shown us that for people who want to start a family, there are some guidelines where, uh, and some of this is my own experience too that I'm adding into this, that we like to see people, uh, you know, people have stable MS for up to several months to at least a year before they pursue pregnancy. Reason being is uh, we know from studies again that people who go into a pregnancy uh, with quiet disease, so to speak, do better during and after pregnancy. So those that go into pregnancy with what I would say hot MS, you know, they have a lot of disease activity, um, even if they do well during pregnancy, because that's a unique time. We, I'm sure we, we'll touch on that maybe, but in that postpartum period, it could be three to four fold uh, greater risk of having issues with their MS going into a pregnancy uh, with you know more disease activity. And so I usually will try to encourage people to get on a therapy for at least a year, then we recheck, how are you doing clinically? What's your exam show? What's your MRI show? But I can tell you that we've also, uh, for some people where maybe they had a mild attack, they recovered very well from, maybe their MRI is not so bad, their exam is completely normal, and they want to start like today. We have we have had that open conversation. Said, okay, you know, that is obviously a, a decision for you and your partner, um, and we can just give you the information that we know. And I've had some people where they've gotten pregnant very quickly because that's also sort of a wild card, right? You don't know how long it's going to take. Um, and so we've had some people get pregnant right away and and you know do very well. 
but my usual uh, party line, if I can say that, is let's try to get your MS under control for at least a year, and then we can start talking about what are next steps. Um, I know that didn't answer your question about therapies. Um, so we don't have a lot of data uh, driving how we counsel people. We do know that one medication, that's an older medication, we tell people you can take that up until you find out you're pregnant, and then you may be able to discontinue that once you find out you're pregnant. Um, there are other medications that are, you could argue that maybe are similar in terms of their safety profile, uh, take up until you find out you're pregnant. Um, but I still caution people uh, around this because we don't really have a lot of data to say, oh, you should continue taking your medication throughout pregnancy or all therapies across the board you can take up until you find out you're pregnant. Um, but, uh, you know, why, why we often don't recommend taking a therapy during pregnancy is because it's a time where people actually do quite well from their MS perspective. Usually the second, third trimester, uh, we are seeing less activity and, in fact, most patients don't have any disease activity during their second, third trimester, and they feel much better outside of the fatigue that comes with, I guess, pregnancy. Um, so it really is a joint decision uh, in terms of how you strategize in family planning. It's an unfortunate reality that health insurance plans can also play a role in therapy decisions. Some plans now require a, what's called a step approach to therapy, insisting that a patient use one or more therapies that have to fail in controlling their MS before a high efficacy therapy can be prescribed. What can be done in situations like this to ensure that patients get the treatment that they and their doctor determine to be the best treatment for them? Yeah, this is uh, continuing to be a, a more challenging situation as we have more therapies, which we're grateful for, um, but that is becoming more difficult because obviously it's the financial impact of these medications. Um, and then also as generics come online, they're cheaper, and that also forces uh, the insurance companies to, to move in a different direction. And so what I have done, uh, and this could be a regional you know, situation where we've been, I think, very fortunate to get the medication we feel is best for the individual is that we do have to do some legwork. So if someone is denied their initial choice that we feel is appropriate for the person, we go to bat for our patient. We put in letters of medical necessity. We um, see them in close follow-up, make our notes longer where we have um, uh, studies referencing why this particular class of medications may be better than the choices that the insurance company is trying to push the patient towards. And then also um, getting on the phone and doing peer to peer, you know, with medical directors. And it, it does take a lot of extra time, I would say. Uh, but for me, because this is so important um, that we really go to the end and back to try to get medications for our patients. Um, and, you know, this is, I know this is recorded, the, the other approach that sometimes we'll take if it really all else fails. So one, there are free drug programs that are out there for, uh, for patients that are, um, it applies to. So that's one thing that is very important. We've utilized that, those programs. And then sometimes we do have to bite the bullet and order the medication that is less preferred and maybe the person just can't tolerate it. So they've failed the medication. And I'll leave that open for interpretation, but that's sometimes a sort of back way that we can get the medication we feel is appropriate, which fortunately we haven't had to do that um, as often as you would think. Well, thank you, Dr. Newsom, for helping us better understand disease modifying therapies and the considerations that should be made in making a, a therapy decision. Before we drill down to talking about what happens after you make that initial therapy decision and then what happens later in someone's MS journey, I just want to take a moment to welcome those of you who have continued to join us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. Please let us know what's on your mind. 
Post your comments and questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the questions box if you joined us on GoToWebinar. Our Ask an MS Expert live event takes place at the same time every Friday, so please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family and your friends. We're talking with Dr. Scott Newsom, an Associate Professor of Neurology and Director of Neurosciences Consultation and Infusion Center at Johns Hopkins Medicine. And we are talking all things DMT, or Disease Modifying Therapy. Dr. Newsom, once someone chooses a disease modifying therapy, the next thing that person thinks about is, how do I know if it's working? So what are some key indicators that people should be aware of to help them answer that question? Yeah, no, great question. So I do think that this is uh, an important time to discuss this where we have to set expectations for our patients who are living with MS. So people who have this journey. Um, these medications that we currently have that are FDA approved are preventive therapies. So I think this is important to recognize um, in part because the medications are not necessarily gonna take away symptoms that someone experiences. If they had a relapse and maybe they uh, suffered loss of sensation somewhere, not that that can't get better over time, but we have to educate people to say, the medication you're gonna start is not necessarily going to improve this. And in fact, I tell people that that's not its role, that's not its job. These medicines are supposed to prevent new things moving forward from occurring, whether it's relapses, new spots on MRI, and then we hope down the road disability, right? And how do we know that the medication someone's on is, is working if it's not taking away symptoms, if they're the same today when they start the medication as they are five years from now, right? Which by the way, that's what we want, right? So what we do is we take periodic checks. We follow people over time, have them come back to clinic, do an exam, listen to the person's history intently, making sure that there's nothing that may have happened between visits that we would deem a relapse or disability worsening doing an MRI periodically over time to make sure that there's not what's called subclinical activity. Because some people will actually have activity show up on their MRI. Even I've seen some people, it's like Christmas, many, many enhancing lesions on the MRI, but they feel fine. They feel fine. And how, what is this disconnect? It's, it's, we still don't understand that by the way. So we have to look at it from a multi-pronged approach so we look at these different spheres, if I can say, of uh, disease activity to determine whether a medication is working or not. Now, uh, when someone initially starts a medication, we do have to let a little bit of time go by before we can say, oh, this is not the right medication based on uh, what, again, disease activity or inflammation. So we at least let about six or so months go by uh, as long as someone's tolerating the medication. Uh, then to check back in with an MRI, uh, a visit, but often we like to see people more than uh, every six months early on. And all those things that I mentioned, utilizing those uh, markers, so to speak, to determine whether a medication is working or not. And so if someone is, again, stable, not having any new issues, and they feel the same today as they do five, 10 years down the road, that means the medication is working. Doesn't mean that we don't have work to do, right? Treating symptoms, trying to improve someone's day-to-day -day quality of life, because as I mentioned early on, that's equally as important as making the big decisions about disease-modifying therapies. Um, but that's sort of, a, I guess, a 50,000-foot view on how we determine um, whether a medicine is working or not. And then I will mention one last thing, um, is that there are newer biomarkers that are gonna be available uh, including this thing that you probably have heard of, neurofilament light, which is a simple blood test that gives us an idea of what's happening behind the scenes. And so we may see in the future that, oh, MRI looks good, someone is not having relapses, 
exam looks relatively stable from the last time we saw them, but this blood biomarker is changing in the wrong direction. What does that mean? So we still have to do more studies to better understand what's the impact of like diabetes, aging, those kind of things on NFL, neurofilament light. But this is a, a really exciting biomarker that we may, may be able to use also in sort of that decision-making about whether a medication is working or not. Well, you mentioned the important role that an MRI exam plays in, in determining how effective a particular medication may be. Once someone is on a disease-modifying therapy, how often should they be receiving an MRI exam? Yeah, so I, I've been uh, lucky enough to be involved in uh, some of these consensus guidelines surrounding MRIs. And it's interesting when you bring many people to the table from different specialties, um, it's, it's interesting how we can't gain consensus on certain things, right? But I would say with MRI, there across the board has been, um, I think, a level of consensus at least early on in someone's journey with MS. So once someone starts on a medication, uh, the consensus has been, as I mentioned, letting a little bit of time go by for someone to be on the medication for it to start working, uh, which is typically around six months. And if all looks good, things are stable. The majority, I think, of specialists are repeating the MRI about a year out from starting the medication. So six months after that, first on baseline MRI, first on treatment baseline MRI. And then again, if things look good, usually a lot of us are going to yearly thereafter for a period of time. Now, that year time period can be broken, right? It's not like you're signing a contract. Um, this is if someone, let's say, develops new symptoms, a relapse, or you're noticing your bedside exam is much different than the prior exam, at least in my practice, we do an MRI before that year time period to see what's going on, to see if there's behind the scenes new activity occurring that's leading to worsening symptoms or worsening functionality. And then also very importantly is what about infections? Because we know that some of our therapies have been associated with infections of the nervous system. So we have to be mindful of that in terms of our monitoring strategy. So it's not just all about, well, how is the MS being controlled? It's also looking at what are the potential side effects that can come from some of our medications um, that can result in not so friendly infections. So I don't know we if that heard, answers your question. <laughs> I, I, th I think it does. Um, we, we've heard from Barbara, and this really is a perfect follow-up to what you were just saying. Uh, Barbara says her MRIs continue to show disease activity six months after she started her therapy. And Barbara's wondering if she should talk with her doctor about trying another therapy. And if I can broaden that question, I'll, I'll add one of my own. Uh, when should someone consider making a change and switching their disease modifying therapy? No, that's an excellent question. So um, I think there are some studies that we can leverage in this situation, meaning that if you start on a therapy and you're within the first, let's say, year or so of your therapy and you're having new disease activity, because of the number of therapies we have available, many of us are quick to switch because we know that we want to try to look forward into the future and prevent as much uh, disability as we can. And I think sitting on a medication too long, like what was done in the past when we didn't have all these therapies, uh, where we were sort of pigeonholed, so to speak, to do that, we have seen the outcome of that, right? And so we don't want to repeat history in that fashion. So we're trying to change the way we treat people and do better. Um, so if someone has been on a therapy, after six months and they've been adherent, so that's another thing that I think comes into the equation. If they've been adherent to their medication, very diligent, they do their MRI, and let's say they have multiple new spots. Are those new spots showing active inflammation, meaning that the contrast that they give uh, during the MRI scanner 
shows up in the spots. Then for me, that's a definite open conversation uh, to say, maybe we need to think about moving to a different medication. Now, let's say someone has one new spot and it's not enhancing, it's not showing active inflammation. In that situation, you don't know when that spot developed. That could have developed on day two of the start of the medication, right? And so you have to think clearly about that and say, okay, well, maybe we're not gonna switch based on that one new spot that's not showing active inflammation because maybe it developed before the medication really became most effective. Um, however, for me, it does change the way I'm gonna monitor, at least in that next few months, doing an MRI and following a patient. So I will repeat the MRI in three months versus six months out. Um, and usually have the person come back to see me face to face. And in that situation, then we have a zero tolerance policy to switch after that. So if a patient recognizes that their disease modifying therapy isn't controlling their MS, what factors should they consider in selecting the next disease modifying therapy? Yeah, so um, it goes back to what I think we talked about earlier, looking at a whole host of things, right? What are the clinical imaging based parameters or you know markers that we're seeing in front of us? How much you know disease activity or new inflammation is occurring while on that that therapy? What are, as you uh, asked me about comorbidities, what are the comorbidities that someone may have? or what are the you know family planning? you know, um, that the individual is interested in in pursuing down the road. So all these things we have to take into consideration. The shared decision-making model as, as uh, we are trying to do with all our patients, uh, I think is very important. So it's a, it's a multitude of factors that we have to consider. I would say this is where I think mechanism of action of a medication is highly critical. Usually when I start to talk about what's the mechanism of action of drugs, there's like a gloss over of the audience because they're like, oh boy, here he goes again. Um, this is though where I think the mechanism of action of a drug is important. So if someone's on a medication and they're having uh, sub, what we call subtherapeutic response, relapses, new spots on MRI, the next therapy we're gonna go towards, at least in my practice, is not a medication that has a similar effect on the immune system as the one that they're on. So the, the therapy targeting one specific immune cell. We're gonna deviate from that and, and start someone on a medication that works differently on the immune system. You know, we heard from Suzanne who wrote that she'd like to know more about MS after 65. We also heard from Alan who says he's 63 years old and he's thinking of stopping his disease modifying therapy. But Alan is wondering if that's a good idea. You briefly touched on this earlier. So what should people consider as they age when it comes to their MS disease modifying therapies? Yeah, I would say this is, uh, hopefully this doesn't sound like a wishy-washy answer because this is another gray area where there's a lot of research uh, happening as we speak and actually clinical trials looking at this. Um, we do know that as we get older, the immune system is not as active. Um, so that is probably the one thing that comes to mind that's a benefit of aging. Everything else doesn't seem to go in our, in our way and, and certainly people have autoimmune conditions. Um, so there may be a, a line in the sand that we don't know yet that is age dependent. So if you're over the age of 65, 70, maybe you could think about, uh, I don't know about stopping a medication, uh, but thinking about this um, terminology called de-escalation. So if someone's on one of those really powerful therapies that we know maybe carry um, uh, more baggage as it relates to side effects, and they've been stable for a while, that might be an opportunity to think about de-escalating to a quote unquote safer medication. And so we've done that for people. Um, I would say we have to be very cautious with just stopping the medication outright. Um, because I have seen people, in fact, in their 60s and 70s, where we thought this medication's not working. Maybe they had a little bit of progression, you know, that we are hearing in the history. 
Um, and then also on our bedside exam, there's maybe a little more weakness. And we say, well, you haven't had a relapse in a while, MRI is stable, uh, why don't we just stop it? Because it clearly is not helping you. And I've had some people actually uh, have relapses in new MRI activity six to 12 months to 18 months later after stopping the medication in that scenario. And so as, we're old, as we get older, we don't recover as well from things that affect our body, right? And so I think right now, my usual um, gestalt in treating people is that, okay, well, if we can continue the medication as long as we feel it's safe and you're tolerating the medication, then we continue it until we have further evidence that says, okay, this group of people with this age or with maybe these comorbidities, you can stop in with having some certainty that MS is not going to rear back up and cause problems. So I'm not in right now um, in the business, so to speak, of stopping medications, but I do think we need to uh, be mindful of what are the potential risks as someone gets older and uh, as it relates to the medication that someone's on. I've heard you mention the importance of adhering to a treatment plan. We know that adherence to therapies can impact their effectiveness. And we've heard from Tina, who said she's been struggling with injection phobia for over four years, and it prevents her from being consistent in taking her medication. She wants to know if there are any tips to help her overcome her phobia. So how important is it for people to adhere to their medication plan? And do you have any advice for Tina? Yeah, so this, uh, I think this goes back to um, th what I said earlier, that the best medication for a person is the one that they'll take, and I'll add to that, the one that they'll take as prescribed. Um, and the reason being is that we've seen people get into trouble where they're less adherent on a medication. Maybe they were great as, when they started, um, and then they became less adherent over time. And that could be for a number of reasons, as you mentioned with Tina and needle phobia. That could also go with other therapies, including oral medications, right? Just because something's oral doesn't mean that someone's gonna be adherent to it, right? And so um, for Tina and others who may be struggling uh, with a particular medication, I usually try to figure out with the person, what are the barriers? You know, if it's needle phobia, that's a tough one to get over, honestly, um, because we expose our patients to many different things, including getting blood work, you know, doing MRIs and getting an IV line for contrast. And then you're asking them to now stick themselves with a, with a medication that could be at different frequencies and depths, depending on the medication. And so uh, for Tina, I would really have that open conversation and say, okay, well, we're concerned about this non-adherence or lack of adherence for the future, because we know from studies and from our experience that this will get someone into trouble down the road with new um, markers of disease activity, new spots on MRI, relapses, et cetera. And so we try to figure out, okay, well, what are our options? What other paths can we take from a treatment perspective? And as I've mentioned a couple of times, we are really, really fortunate that we have all these therapies that we can choose from and not just therapies that are self-administered injectables. We have other routes of administration that we can choose from. And then that's where we have to have that shared decision-making, whether it's a, a pill that's given once a day, twice a day, maybe an infusible therapy that is, you know, once a month, every six months, and then there are other therapies that are uh, in development that may be, uh, you know, other injectable therapies, but less frequent, whether it's monthly or even uh, with a, uh, an extended interval dosing uh, down the road. So uh, you just have to have an open conversation, see what some of the barriers are with adherence. Are these barriers something that you can get over? And if not, shift your attention to a different therapy. So in shifting your attention to a different therapy, should you start that next therapy, a different therapy? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious whether there are, it's, it's a different process. Is it a different procedure than starting your very first disease modifying therapy? 
or is it really the same? Was that your question? Because that's a great question, actually. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I would say that this is this is critical because um, we have seen some people get into trouble switching. So one therapy to another. Um, so it is a little bit of a different process than just starting from a therapy right from the get go. In part, it's related to washout. So how long does someone need to wash out of their initial therapy when they're going on to another therapy? And, you know, realizing that these medications have uh, different half-lives, but most of them are in the system for at least a few months after you stop the medication today. Um, but you could get into a situation where you stop the medication today and you wait too long to start the second medicine. And that opens the door up for potential reactivation of the MS. And we don't want that to happen. So also another thing that's important is from a safety perspective, if you have someone who is switching to another medication because let's say their blood counts have dipped and have put them in a, a dangerous level uh, and we know if they stay that low for a long period of time, that could impact them from a safety perspective, including uh, you know, that brain infection that we, uh, we hear about PML. And so we want them to get off that medication, but if we start them too soon on another medication, that may add to that risk. And so what I encourage people to do is work with their clinician very closely in determining what is the right next steps. Um, I would say for our practice, um, there are instances where we go stop the medication today, tomorrow you go on your next medication and then other situations where we wait a couple weeks or a month. So it's highly variable depending on the medication, uh, what the blood counts look like, what the pre-medication uh, MS status was from a disease activity perspective. So there's a lot of factors that go in, but it is, to your initial question, um, it's different. It is different than when you're just starting on a medication from the get-go. Well, thank you, Dr. Newsom, for sharing your expertise on an important topic. You know, on a recent webcast, we were talking about the value and importance of increasing your health literacy. I think you've helped us do that today. And I want to thank everyone who submitted some really excellent questions. You know, I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are resources that you can count on to be current and credible. I wanna remind you that if we were unable to get to your questions today, please know that the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is available to answer your specific questions and connect you to the very best resources. I'll share all the ways that you can connect with an MS Navigator in just a moment. And if you'd like to follow Dr. Scott Newsom, I encourage you to visit hopkinsmedicine.org. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're in the midst of an emotionally difficult time for so many people. And I wanna make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. And you can reach that lifeline by calling 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you can take a few minutes to give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts and audio content. We're all witnessing that even during the pandemic, MS doesn't stop, and neither does the National MS Society. This webcast is just one example of how the MS Society has created virtual programming 
on the fly so that no one has to face MS alone. They've also created virtual support groups, provided resources and information about COVID-19 so that people affected by MS can get answers to their questions and healthcare providers can deliver the very best care to their patients. The society continues to amplify the voices of the MS movement to influence critical public policy decisions, and they never stop advancing the research that will find a cure. The National MS Society COVID-19 Response Fund has been established to ensure that the society can meet the urgent and expanding needs of the MS community during these unprecedented times. And I'm asking you, as you're able, to support the MS Society's work by making a donation to the COVID-19 Response Fund. To donate, just text the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll contribute today. Frankly, it's never been more important. I promise that we'd share all the ways for you to connect with an MS Navigator. You can find them on the MS Society's website at nationalmssociety.org. You can contact an MS Navigator by phone at 1-800-344-4867, or you can email an MS Navigator at contactusnmss at nmss.org. You can also connect with the National MS Society on your favorite social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And when you do connect, please make sure to like those social posts and subscribe to those social channels. And you really wanna make sure you, that you get on the society's mailing list by signing up at their website. That way you'll receive regular updates on upcoming programs and the latest information on MS treatments, research, and how to live the very best life with MS. I'd like to thank Dr. Scott Newsom for joining us today. And again, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your really excellent questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review on the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is really important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute. So I hope you'll take that minute and please fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Scott Newsom and the National MS Society, I wanna thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.